So thank you everyone for coming today. I'm excited to introduce Sergey Norin, who will be talking about the densities of minor closed graph classes. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rose, for the invitation. Uh, uh, this is a topic uh, I really like uh, thinking and talking about. Uh, and I uh, gave several talks uh, in, in the last few years, but uh, the material changes from talk to talk uh, in particular. Uh, today, I will talk about some of joint work uh, with uh, uh, Kevin Hendry and David Wood and with Bruce Reed, Andrew Thomason and David Wood uh, that uh, I never mentioned before and uh, also about uh, joint work with Rohan Kapadia, which we did uh, about five years ago, but uh, which uh, we only wrote up uh, recently. So uh, the talk will be a, a survey uh, of some of the recent results, but also uh, uh, several classical results that are known about uh, extremal properties, uh, and in particular, densities of minor closed graph classes. Uh, to uh, uh, contrast what's known for minor closed graph classes uh, with uh, uh, what's uh, known uh, for dense classes, I'll start uh, briefly by mentioning what's known uh, for dense classes of graphs. Uh, first, uh, very briefly, some notations that we use. So I assume that uh, uh, most of you, or ideally all of you are familiar with basic things about graphs. Uh, this, so we'll only look at simple graphs and finite today uh, view of, and just small v of g and small e of g for brevity will denote the number of vertices and edges. And the chromatic number uh, chi of g will appear uh, many times uh, for various reasons as an important parameter. And uh, the definition of chromatic number is, of course, is the minimum number of colors needed to color the properly color vertices of the graph. But for us, uh, it's actually useful uh, sometimes to think of, about it in an equivalent but somewhat strange way as a minimum number of parts in a multi-parted or complete multi-parted graph into which you can embed the graph G. Okay, so uh, a lot of graph theory uh, somehow happens in two different regimes uh, for very dense graphs where positive proportion of edges is present and uh, very sparse graphs where uh, average degree is constant. And there are murky things in between uh, where little is known. So let me talk about uh, what's known about densities of dense graph classes. And uh, here it's natural to look at monotone graph classes. Uh, so classes where you forbid certain subgraphs. A classical Erdersch-Stone theorem says that uh, if you forbid in a large graph some particular uh, small graph as a subgraph of chromatic number T, then the largest number of edges you can have is basically by having the complete multi-parted graph. So by uh, taking a uh, balance blow up of the graph kt minus one, uh, then you get uh, roughly t minus two over t minus one of all possible edges in your graph. And because of this alternative definition of chromatic number, which I just mentioned, you cannot embed graph H uh, in such a balance blow up. So you get a graph with density as shown uh, uh, on the slide uh, and uh, no subgraph isomorphic uh, to your graph H and that's best possible. So chromatic number of your graph H deter uh, 
drives the maximum density you can get without having uh, uh, without having H as a subgraph. Okay, let me restate Erdős Stone theorem uh, more generally. So if you have any class of graphs which is uh, monotone, closed undertaken subgraphs, then uh, well, you might have uh, it might be determined by forbidding uh, several or infinitely many uh, different graphs, but uh, it's still the chromatic number that determines the behavior and situation is pretty clean. So you just look at the minimum chromatic number of a graph that's not in your family. And the Stone theorem says that uh, the number of edges uh, of graph in your family is t minus two over t minus one of the maximum possible number of edges. And you can get that much by just taking all t minus one chromatic graphs. And reformulating it for the last time, uh, we do just define the density of a dense graph, monotone graph plus F as a, uh, essentially limb soup of the proportion of edges uh, that you can have uh, by being a graph in your family and having a large number of vertices. Then this density uh, is clearly determined uh, from, the, uh, from the theorem above. So it's determined by minimum chromatic number of the graph not in the family. And it's equal to one minus one over t minus one for some positive integer t. So if, if density is defined in this way for monotone uh, families is what you are interested in, then essentially everything is known. Uh, it's pretty clear how to determine the density of your family. Uh, and uh, it's clear what densities can be achieved and what cannot. And uh, in the previous iterations uh, of this talk, I was saying that in contrast for sparse graphs and for minor closed graph classes, uh, much less is known. But as, uh, uh, as years uh, progress, we seem to know more and more. So now, by now, it seems like a lot, quite a lot is known also uh, in the sparse regime. But this picture is uh, more complicated. And that's what I'll be talking about. So uh, let's. Uh, introduce the uh, main definition. So minus uh, 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 operation of taking a minus is somehow fundamental for both graph and mat matroid theory, theory of the sparse graphs and matroids. Uh, so a graph H is a minor of a graph G uh, if uh, uh, you can obtain it by uh, contracting edges and also uh, deleting vertices and edges. And we are, now we'll be looking at minor closed graph classes. So classes of graphs, which are not only closed undertaken subgraphs, but also undertaken minors. Uh, and uh, lots of uh, nice uh, classes that uh, you, you might be interested in considering a minor closed uh, graphs embeddable on a fixed surface, including planar graphs, forests. For us, graphs that do not contain a particular complete graph as a minor uh, would be uh, of particular interest. And there are some other uh, more exotic uh, classes of graphs, such as graphs link linklessly embeddable in space. Embeddable in space so that there are no two cycles uh, uh, well, which link which it with each other. Uh, an old theorem of Mada says that if you have proper minor closed class of graphs, so minor cl class closed undertaken minus, uh, which doesn't contain everything, so it excludes some graph, 
then the number of edges is at most a linear function in the number of vertices. So we shouldn't measure density anymore as a proportion of edges in the complete graphs that we can have, uh, but uh, a more natural uh, notion of density would be uh, essentially average degree or uh, maximum possible, it could be a supremum. So supremum of the ratio of the uh, number of edges to the number of vertices taken over graphs uh, in your family, non-null graphs. So this non-zero number of edges. Uh, this non, yes. Now, uh, the densities for dense graph classes uh, differed uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, uh, looking there, looking just at supremum, uh, wouldn't give clean results because uh, of some issues with small graphs. Uh, here, uh, frequently, it doesn't matter. So I use a simpler definition. Secondly, in the dense case, excluding just one graph gave essentially the same result uh, as excluding several graphs. So for every family, the density of the family was uh, uh, guided by exclude, uh, by what happens if you just forbid one particular graph as a subgraph. That's not the case for minor closed classes at all. Uh, yet, uh, typically, uh, the, what is most investigated is the uh, uh, density of minor closed classes where you only forbid one minor. So it's called the extremal function of a graph. Uh, C of H is the density of the class uh, where you forbid H as a minor. Or equivalently, C of H is the infimum uh, of the constant C, so that uh, if your number of H's is at least C times the number of vertices, then you're guaranteed uh, an H minor. So this extremal function, uh, is what's most studied when the density of minor closed classes is considered. And uh, let me talk about, uh, about it first. Uh, some simple examples uh, of the density and uh, of uh, 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 the extremal function. Uh, if you have a forest, it's well known that the number of edges is uh, at most number of vertices minus one. So the density uh, of the class of forest is one. Uh, you can never have more edges than vertices and you can have roughly the same. And because forests are exactly the uh, simple graphs with no K3 minor, the extremal function of K3 is one. Uh, similarly for planar graphs, earlier formula gives that the number of edges is at most three times the number of vertices. Uh, so the density of the class of planar graphs uh, is three. And uh, uh, well-known Kuratowski theorem says that uh, planar graphs are exactly graphs with no K5 or K33 minor. And it's not that hard. Uh, so knowing a structure theorem for graphs with no K5 minor, uh, one can show that a similar formula holds, and in particular, extremal function of K5 is also uh, is uh, three. So, which one gets from similar formula. The main interest uh, in the extremal function uh, originally came, and especially extremal function of uh, complete graphs came from Hardwiger conjecture, uh, which uh, is a conjecture that uh, if you exclude a complete graph on T plus one vertices as a minor, then uh, you, your graph must be T colorable. Uh, for uh, it's, a, it's a rather famous conjecture. It's mostly, uh, it's largely famous because for t equal four, 
it strengthens already the focal theorem. Uh, so it has been proved for smaller values of t, uh, for t equals three by Hadwiger. Uh, it was known to be equivalent to focal theorem for t equal four, and so was proven by Apple and Haken uh, when focal theorem was proved in 1976. And uh, uh, in an uh, extremely impressive result in 1990s, Robertson, Seymour, and Thomas reduce the next case uh, to the four color theorem, uh, but everything else is open. And uh, so it's a far reaching generalization of the four color theorem and uh, uh, approaching it from various direction, uh, however one can, uh, is seems like a, a quite a tantalizing, uh, goal in graph theory. And uh, in general, until very recently, the extremal functions provided uh, the best uh, approach. Why? Well, so here is an observation. Uh, if, you, if a graph has no kt plus one minor, then you are twice extremal function of kt colorable. So remember extremal function. So by definition of the extremal function, uh, you always get a vertex uh, average degree at most twice uh, CKT uh, if you have subacidic of K plus one. So that's a typo. Uh, average degree is at most two C of KT plus one. And therefore, you can find a vertex of degree at most this much and delete it. So uh, roughly the extremal function of kt plus one gives you a bound on the chromatic number. And uh, the extremal uh, function of kt uh, in a series of development uh, has been determined exactly uh, for all small values of t. So for t at most nine, uh, it is uh, known to be t minus two. So for uh, smaller t, it was determined uh, by Dirac and Mada, then by Jorgensen for t equal eight, and then by uh, Zichasson and Robin Thomas for t equal nine. And uh, if this pattern continued, it would prove that uh, graphs with no kt plus one minor are roughly 2t colorable. So Hadwig conjecture is only a factor of two of, uh, which would be still much, much better than uh, what we currently know about Hadwig's conjecture. So this approach using extremal function would allow pretty strong result, except uh, following uh, a series of development, uh, Thomason in 2001 determined, uh, asymptotically determined precisely the extremal function of KT. Uh, it's on the order of T root log T. Uh, and even the constant in the leading term is known. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's roughly, uh, I'm off by a factor of two here, but uh, it's roughly half uh, of the constant that, uh, that is shown on the slide. So it's known precisely. And uh, it's quite a bit bigger. So it's super linear uh, in uh, T. And the bound uh, which comes from the theorem of Thomason and observation on the previous slide was essentially the best known bound on the number of colors needed for Hadwiger's conjecture. For, uh, well, uh, from 2001 until very recently. So uh, uh, only uh, last year, uh, jointly with Zichasson and uh, 
uh, Waterloo's own uh, loop postal, we were able to uh, do better than density. So density for a while provided the best possible approach. And that's one reason it was studied. Uh, let me mention, uh, what are the extreme examples? What are the densest possible graphs that don't have KT as a minor? Uh, they were just random graphs of constant density. So they provided the worst possible examples. So, and uh, it's, uh, I just want to uh, keep track of what are the extreme examples for this problem to point out uh, some difficulties uh, and, uh, and new ideas uh, in different cases. Uh, now, moving on from complete graphs. Uh, the extremal function has been known for several other structured families of graphs. Uh, Chudnovsky, Reed, and Seymour, and Kostichka and Prince determined uh, it for complete biparted graphs exactly uh, when one of the sides is very small. So uh, these are the two theorems there. Uh, answering the question uh, of Reed uh, and Wood, a uh, few years ago, jointly with Tsoka, Irin Law, Hehoi Wu, uh, and Leanne Yepriman, uh, we uh, determined the extremal function for disjoint union of odd cycles. It seems like a simple uh, class of graphs, uh, but uh, actually uh, it took quite some effort to determine. And finally, uh, in a uh, very recent result, uh, Kevin Hendry and David Wood determined the extremal function of Peterson graph, which is one specific graph uh, which is, of course, very important uh, from graph theory, uh, point of view of graph theory. But that was, uh, I mean, that's a 30 page paper. I mean, th they do more than determine the extremal function. But still, for a particular graph, uh, it seems uh, determining the extremal function exactly uh, is, a, even for a small and very symmetric graph, is fairly hard. So, what we'll try to do. Uh, mostly uh, in the result uh, I'll mention next is to understand the asymptotic behavior of the extremal function for large graphs. Extending the result uh, uh, for Thomason's result for complete graphs in 2005, Thomason and Myers uh, determined uh, the extremal function uh, fairly precisely for almost all graphs, in particular for all fairly dense uh, uh, regular graphs. So theorem says the following. Suppose you have a, a, a graph, uh, let me concentrate on the regular case. Uh, a regular graph with uh, average degree polynomial in the number of vertices. Then your extremal function is essentially the same as the uh, one for complete graph. It's of the form t times square root now log of your average degree. Uh, and the leading constant is the same. And uh, the formula, perhaps, I mean, it's a nice formula. But perhaps what's more important uh, is understanding where does this formula come from? And it comes basically by considering random graphs of constant density and checking uh, how dense must they be so that with positive probability uh, you can get uh, this graph H or probability almost one as a mine. So extreme example are still random graphs of constant density. So that determines the extremal function for more for graphs which are fairly dense. So there are now two different dense versus sparse regimes. Uh, we are now talking about minor closed classes. So in that sense, we kind of work in the sparse families, but now uh, I'm looking at excluding a graph 
uh, which is either dense, in which case Tom, Thomas and Mark's theorem uh, gives a complete answer, or we can try excluding a sparse graph, in which case uh, uh, the theorem above actually doesn't give a result. And yet, uh, in most of the cases, even when d is not polynomial in the number of vertices, uh, we expect the answer to be the same. Uh, so, so we want to extend further this theorem. Yet here is an issue. Uh, due to theorem of Alon and Furedi, uh, if we try the same approach uh, in the regime when average degree is uh, logarithmic or sublogarithmic in the number of vertices, then random graphs don't work. Uh, random graphs uh, already uh, of positive density, as soon as they have enough vertices uh, to contain graph H, uh, contain any sparse graph H. That's what this alone for Eddy theorem says. So if the extremal function for sparse graphs behaves like in the theorem, extremal examples are different. Uh, and uh, very recently, jointly with Bruce Reed, uh, Andrew Thomason, and David Wood, we proved the following. Uh, if we have a regular graph with a constant degree, large but just constant, then still the formula from the previous slide holds for almost all graphs, not all, but almost all. Uh, which uh, overcomes uh, the problem I was just mentioned. And the extremal examples are strange. They somehow come in between the Turan type examples which we've seen uh, in the very beginning and random graphs. Extremal examples here are blow-ups of random graphs of constant size, uh, which is a strange, ob strange object. Uh, so it's half to run like, half random like. And uh, even more recently, so shortly after this result, uh, Thomason and Wales uh, also proved the bound in the other direction, showing that uh, uh, Thomason's constant lambda times t times uh, square root of log of average degree is an upper bound on the extremal function for every graph, uh, which strengthens and result of Bruce Reed and David Wood, uh, which proved the same, but uh, for slightly uh, worse constant. So essentially, uh, uh, sorry, please. sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think that my slides are about one behind on my screen. Would you mind uh, like closing it and restarting it again to see if that fixes it? Okay. Thanks. And also, if anyone else is having that problem, maybe you can say it in chat because it could just be me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've been to another talk where there was this issue too, and I don't really know the way of fixing it. So if this doesn't work, then. But it's not everybody, it's always up to date. Oh, okay. So it's just some of us. Okay. Okay, that's where I was. Right, okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry so, for the to summarize, uh, for almost all graphs, uh, if they are balanced enough, or at least regular, uh, t times root of log of uh, average degree is now known to be the extremal function. But uh, if the graph H is very, very sparse, uh, means the graph H itself belongs to a minor closed class, the answer is different. Uh, so here is a recent uh, theorem uh, joined with uh, Kevin Hendry and David Wood, 
uh, which uh, at first sounds a bit strange. So let me try to explain it. So instead of the extremal function of a graph H, we will define a CKI extremal function, which is basically what the extremal function would be if the Turan type graphs, uh, complete multi parted graphs, were extremal examples. So it's infimum of constant C, so that uh, graphs with average degree C uh, contain H as a minor, but not all graphs, just complete multi parted graphs. So this CKI of H is much smaller, typically, could be much smaller than C of H. Uh, and what we prove that is the following. If we take a graph H, which belongs to a proper minor closed graph class, and exclude that graph as a minor, then uh, CK of H and C of H are roughly the same. Uh, so that means that Complete multi-parted graphs become no longer, so no longer random graphs, not blow up of, of random graphs, but complete multi-parted graphs uh, are the source of extremal examples. Uh, when your graph H is very sparse, say H is a tree or H is K to T or K three T as we've seen in the previous uh, setting or H has bounded three bits. So these cases turns out to be different. Now, this look, uh, let me just tell you some consequences of this theorem. Uh, in particular, we know that if H is very large graph in a given uh, proper minor close class, then extremal function is at most the number of vertices. So that's different than the number of vertices times root of average log of average degree. Root of log of average degree could be a substantial constant, but this constant is not needed uh, if your graph is very sparse. And in fact, if H is bipartite, then we can replace one with one half, in which case it's tight because uh, extremal function of any uh, graph is at least half the number of vertices because uh, you need, uh, because complete graphs, uh, which have a little bit fewer vertices, do not contain H, cannot contain H as a minor. So for bipartite graphs uh, in, uh, in minor closed families, we know extremal functions. So unfortunately, we don't quite know a clean formula, cannot prove the clean formula for Sikai of H. Uh, also, we have a complicated looking conjecture, uh, so, uh, which would complete the picture. So, uh, so, so far I've been talking about extremal function and together with this last theorem, it says the following. If your graph H is fairly balanced, if it's not, there are some other issues, then uh, the answer is roughly number of vertices root of log of average degree, unless your graph itself belongs to a very sparse class, in which case you don't need root of log of average degree. It's just the number of vertices times some constant, which is between one and one half. And uh, you can say more about that constant uh, by trying to estimate how the, uh, uh, how the complete uh, multi-parted graphs look like. All right, so now I want uh, to uh, move uh, to thinking about uh, densities of general minor closed graph families, not just minor closed graph families determined by forbidden one graph. And the type of questions uh, I'll be talking about, uh, they come, uh, from uh, the originate in the paper of David Epstein uh, from 2010, uh, who started investigating not just even the density of any particular minor closed class, 
but the set of all densities of minor closed graph classes. Uh, and uh, the pro so the properties of this set. Uh, in particular, uh, he asked if the density of every minor closed graph class is rational. And uh, well, so one of the theorem I'll show in a few slides is uh, that uh, the answer is yes. But before that, uh, let me talk a little bit about tools. And tools are heavy, some of the tools are heavy. One of them is uh, uh, the, perhaps the most powerful tool one can use when talking about graph minus. It's robertson simur graph, graph minus theorem, which says that uh, uh, er, that uh, every proper closed, proper minor closed graph families is determined by a finite list uh, of excluded minors. So for every graph family, there are finitely many graphs so that this family is determined by forbidding this finitely many graphs as minors. Uh, so this is a, I mean, this theorem is a, uh, culmination of a 20 uh, series of 20 papers. It's uh, uh, requires a lot of theory to prove, but sometimes it's easy to apply. For example, one can immediately deduce that uh, the set of densities of minor closed classes is countable because there are only countably many minor closed classes different because each of them is determined by forbidding finitely many graphs. And in fact, I mean, I cannot make this statement, but uh, because I mean, uh, I'm comparing two true statements. In some sense, I'll try to justify that it's almost equivalent. Like it seems, uh, I believe it's very unlikely to prove that even this result, even countability of D without this very strong uh, excluded, uh, excluded minus zero, uh, graph minus zero. Let me show you another application, uh, 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 which is a, a nice uh, result, uh, uh, which in, in a more complex form uh, uh, was, was also present in the uh, Epstein's paper. Uh, it says that uh, the set of densities of minor closed classes is nowhere dense. So that's stronger than uh, countable. Uh, so what we will prove is that uh, somewhat stronger. It's actually that it's well ordered uh, that uh, for every uh, point X, there is an interval above X uh, that doesn't intersect D, not S, I'm sorry, another misprint. So we want to prove uh, the existence of interval uh, above any real number X that doesn't intersect our set of densities. Well, by graph minus theorem, uh, there are finitely many, many minor minimal graphs in any class uh, in any class of graphs. In particular, there are finitely many minor minimal graphs with density bigger than x. So the finite list of graphs such that uh, if the density of your graph is bigger than x, then you contain one of them and the density of each of this graph is bigger than x. So then just take the minimum of densities of these graphs. Uh, uh, so density is just the ratio of the number of edges to the number of vertices. Then no minor closed graph class uh, and well, it's bigger than X, so let it be X plus Delta. Then Z gives us the uh, interval we want because for minor closed graph class to have density bigger than X, it must contain gra graph in it with density bigger than X 
but that means it will contain graph in it with density at least x plus delta. So that proves uh, uh, that densities are well ordered. Uh, fairly, uh, fairly quickly from the graph minus theorem, but that's a powerful tool. Okay, and now, so now let me talk about uh, uh, the theorem uh, we proved with Rohan Kapadia, uh, answering uh, David Epstein's question that in fact, uh, the set of densities, uh, so is a subset of rational numbers. So densities of minor closed graph classes are rational. Uh, we prove something stronger. Uh, so rather than looking just at densities, one can look at maximum number of edges a graph in minor closed family can have uh, when it has given number of vertices. So let X of n or extremal, I mean, you can call this an extremal function. So X of n, be just the maximum number of edges of a graph in your family on n vertices. Uh, then what we can prove uh, answering uh, a question uh, of uh, uh, Guillaume Gerard and Wittel, uh, a special case of their question, uh, which was asked more generally, is that this extremal function for any proper minor class is eventually periodic. So it's very well behaved. It's a function which is just constant away from linear function. And the offset from the linear function uh, is just uh, a periodic, eventually periodic function. Uh, so, uh, so in particular bounded by a constant. This theorem implies that the densities are rational with some thinking, because it implies that the, uh, that the leading term of this linear function is rational. Uh, but we prove the theorems together. Um, but it's easier, perhaps, to think about the proof of the st second stronger theorem. So let me try to very informally say a few words about the proof uh, without uh, getting uh, into any of the technicalities, uh, except that, I mean, the, I mean, somehow the devil is in the details, uh, but, uh, and, uh, but at least some ideas uh, I'll try to convey in a couple of pictures. So the proof uses, uh, um, on top of the Robertson Simul graph minus theorem, which I mentioned, for which we also need a labeled version, uh, we need uh, an asymmetric version of the grid theorem, which was recently proved by Jim Gillis uh, and, and his student uh, uh, Benson, I think, Joris, uh, which says that either your graph can be broken down along very small separation in lots of pieces, or it has moderately thick and very, very long grid in it. And on top of it, we need, an as we need to overlay it with an asymmetric version of robertson simur flat wall theorem, which says that if this, if this grid is fat enough, then uh, it has lots of planar-like pieces inside. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, so that's some of the toolkit. Uh, with this toolkit, uh, uh, we do the following. So we find in every large graph, a collection, a, a very, very large collection of small bits, which are called patches, which I'm not going to define formally, uh, which are all glued together on the same set of paths as shown on this picture. So there is a, a very, very long collection of paths, 
and to get and on them in order we have a uh a collection of uh this patches glued on in the following manner so what do i mean by this picture it means that each patch is a fragment of the graph so that the boundary of this patch the boundary of this fragment where it connects to the rest of the graph are exactly the red vertices on the picture so the vertices on the path uh, on on my uh, guiding path uh, two at most two vertices per path and then so i will look at this large collection and i will classify patches in it as heavy light or balanced depending on how the number of edges in them compares to delta, which think of it as the density of the class, times the number of vertices of the patch minus Q, which is the number of paths. Why is that relevant? Because what I will try to do is collapse every patch uh, by replacing it by just Q vertices, one per pass. So I'll contract the pass in it and delete everything else. Now, what can happen in a large graph in my family? Uh, it could be that lots of these patches are heavy, but then I'll glue them together along the, along the path, and I will get a graph that's too dense, that's denser than the density of my class. That secretly uses uh, graph minus theorem because it says that if I can glue a million of things together, then I can glue infinitely many. Uh, or the patches are light, but if they are light, I can collapse them and increase the density of my graph, uh, make it denser and denser, which will contradict eventually that the density of my class is this delta. Or lots of them are balanced, in which case uh, I can collapse them as I described uh, and preserve uh, the remainder, the, this, I mean, if I'm working with the dancer's graph, uh, the number of edges minus delta times the number of vertices. So the remainder in that theorem, which I want to be periodic. That still is not enough to prove the periodicity, but it's kind of close. You need to again apply the, uh, in a technical manner, the graph minus theorem saying that those patches can basically made of small size. And then uh, you can, uh, you can uh, deduce the result. So that's very vague outline of the proof. Now, an important question is how do we get such a, such a collection on this picture? Uh, if the three bits uh, of your graph, if it's basically tree-like, then you get it by just cutting up the whole graph on separations. Uh, so you, the whole graph has a path-like structure as we want. Uh, if the three bits is large, then we get this moderately thick and very, uh, and very long grid. We find planar bits inside. And inside this planar bits, basically what we find is just a small diamond. I mean, perhaps something smaller than a diamond, a pair of triangles which are glued together and have nothing extraneous attaching to them and glue them along the grid. Okay, so that's, I mean, uh, adding 30 pages of detail to this argument gives the, uh, gives the proof. Okay. Uh, let me tell you now uh, uh, a few uh, other, 
uh, a few open questions and a few uh, directions in which one can try extend uh, this result. Topologically minor closed classes are another type of, my, of sparse graph classes. So a graph H is a topological minor of G if a subdivision of H is a subgraph of G or equivalently, if you can obtain uh, it from G by, by deleting things and only contract, contracting edges incident to a vertex of degree two suppressing vertices of degree two. So that's a more restricted operation, yet topologically minor closed classes also have linear number of edges. And Yarek Neshetri asked whether our previous theorem can be extended to topologically minor closed classes. As I mentioned, we really need the graph minor theorem. We really need well quasi-ordering. And it doesn't work for topological uh, minors. And uh, New Robertson conjectured that all the abstraction come from Robertson chains. And for simple graphs, uh, an analog of Robertson chain is the following. It's a bunch of triangles glued in a line, one vertex at a time, uh, as on this picture. Uh, in Chun Hun Liu's uh, thesis, uh, advised by Robin Thomas, uh, they proved uh, an analog uh, of uh, uh, graph minor theorem for topological minors. Uh, if you exclude a Robertson chain, so if you have a class of graphs closed undertaken topological minors, then it, it's determined by excluding finitely many topological minors. If the class itself doesn't contain all Robertson chains. Uh, if it does, that doesn't have to be true. Uh, now, Robertson chains, they have density uh, three halves, the class of Robertson chains. It's easy to calculate. So adding one triangle adds two vertices and three edges. So classes below three half in density uh, have well quasi order uh, and above don't have to be. And what we prove uh, with Rohan uh, is that that three halves is exactly uh, the threshold uh, at which uh, densities behave completely different of topologically minor closed classes. Every density above three halves can be density of a minor closed class. So just everything. But below three halves, uh, densities, I suspect are still rational, even though we didn't prove it. But at least the number of densities is countable and they are well ordered. So that's kind of a convincing argument that uh, well quasi ordering is really necessary. Somehow the threshold for well quasi ordering is the threshold for topological minor closed classes. Uh, of the switch of behavior. Okay, so these are the results uh, which uh, I wanted to mention uh, in this talk, uh, giving a picture of what's known uh, for densities of minor closed classes. Now, let me mention some open problems. Well, this talk is graph and matroids. And uh, the questions uh, about the extremal uh, function and about the densities actually translate to the, uh, I mean, they, they make sense for matroids. Uh, so instead of the number of vertices for matroids, one needs to consider rank. And the growth rate, rate function, uh, which was uh, studied, uh, well, in particular by uh, Gill and Kabel, Kung and Vito, uh, in the theorem below, uh, is uh, corresponds to the maximum number of edges with given number of vertices. So it's the maximum number of elements in matroids in a class uh, with given rank symbol. Uh, it could be linear, like for graphs. It also has quadratic exponential and unbounded regime. And uh, uh, Gillen, Gerard, and Vital conjectured for linear dense minor closed classes, 
uh, results uh, analogous uh, to what we derive uh, for uh, graphs. Uh, that uh, the density should exist and be rational, and in fact, the growth rate function should be linear function plus eventually periodic function. It seems tempting, at least for binary matroids, to try to carry the proof through. Uh, well, quasi ordering is now there. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the flat grid theorem uh, seems to be absent. But you don't really, I mean, maybe there is a way to cheat uh, and uh, to not use the uh, full strength of the uh, of the flat wall theorem, uh, it was used uh, uh, in our proof uh, somehow fairly minor. So I mean, uh, if I knew more about matroids, I would be tempted to try to extend the proof to binary uh, uh, to binary matroids. And I mean, the audience of this seminar is uh, are the perfect people to to prove it. Uh, now, still there are things that are not known about densities of minor closed classes. How complicated is this set? I don't know if the problem of membership uh, in this set is decidable. Nor do I know what happens if you're explicitly given a minor closed class. Can you figure, say, by excluded minus? Can you figure out its density? Uh, it's unclear. For all I know, both of this, so both of these questions could be undecidable or could be polynomially easy. So they could easily have polynomial algorithms. Finally, it seems like for topological minor clause classes, we know almost everything, like a small interval. Uh, for which uh, the description, uh, we don't have the description. And uh, I thought that given this description should now be possible, but uh, I worked on it uh, uh, with, uh, we are currently working on it with my colleague Adrian Vetta and student Jain uh, Diame. And it seems hard. I mean, we can do it about halfway but it seems like it's still a genuinely complicated object, the set of remaining densities of topologically minor closed classes. Uh, so these are, these are the open questions uh, uh, about the general set of densities that I like. There are also uh, several questions about particular uh, densities that I open, uh, but uh, let me just stop uh, at this point, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've had a hard time figuring out how to do applause, but I hope we can virtually do it. I see the handcuffs in the uh, participants list. Uh, so at this point, let me ask if there are any questions in the audience. Uh, you can go on. So if someone raised their hand. Uh, are there any other questions? Question about so we for matroids, um, we had a conjecture that uh, you get something like well quasi ordering, but but when you put in densities. So if I've got a class of matroids, um, if I give you an infinite set of matroids, then there should be uh, some matroid that has a minor with the, that's the two matroids where one is a minor of the same density and size as the other. Would something like that be true for topological minors or not? Or is, I guess maybe these are... So, I mean, I guess, I'm, I mean, uh, 
So must not be true for a labeled version because then our counter examples won't work. But I'm not, I mean, we need labeled version of everything. Uh, and uh, counter examples uh, depend on labeled versions. So, so I know that it's not true for labeled version, but I don't know if it's not true for unlabeled. Uh, but probably also not, right? I mean, the well ordering argument would go through, I guess, if uh, if that conjecture was true for topological minus, it would prove that the set of densities is well ordered, and that's not true. Uh, All right, are there any other questions? All right, let me go ahead and stop.